We spend many billions of dollars each year on the discovery and development of new drugs, but almost none of it addresses two crucial questions. How do these new therapies compare with already known ones? And what are the relative benefits and harms in a particular situation for a person like you? Such questions can best be answered by comparative effectiveness research. And that's the topic of this week's Healthcare Triage. To get approval from the Food and Drug Administration, drugs must be proved both effective and safe. The costs of doing this are significant, and they're most often borne by the pharmaceutical industry. But the FDA's bar, while meaningful, often is not very useful for what physicians and patients really care about every day, how effective and safe drugs are compared with one another. Consider antibiotics. In my work as a pediatrician, questions about their use comes up a lot. Which drug is the best first-line therapy for which common illnesses? We don't know. How long should we treat for different infections? We don't know. What are the relative trade-offs between benefits and side effects in different patients in different circumstances? We don't know. The questions we need answered are legion. All the guidelines and practices we have are best guesses. Comparative effectiveness research can take on many forms and involve more than drugs. Because of a trial published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, we now know that an intensive lifestyle intervention works better than metformin to promote weight loss. A study published in JAMA Pediatrics last year showed that adding individual health coaching to enhance primary care reduced pediatric obesity, but no more than enhanced primary care alone. A comparison of different levels of insurance published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that enhanced drug insurance coverage led to increased medication adherence, lower patient spending, and lower rates for a first major vascular event like a heart attack or stroke with no increased overall healthcare spending. We know that high blood pressure is both terribly prevalent and a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We also know that there are a lot of drugs out there, all FDA approved, that can help reduce the risk by better controlling blood pressure. But which is best? This question is not new. In 2002, the results of the antihypertensive and lipid lowering treatment to prevent heart attack trial, a comparative effectiveness trial, were published in JAMA. It's more well known as All Hat. Participants had to be at least 55, have hypertension, and have at least one other risk factor for coronary heart disease. They were randomly assigned to take one of four drugs, each with an entirely different mechanism representing a different class of drugs. Chlorthalidone is a diuretic, or a drug that increases urine output. Amlodipine, a calcium channel blocker, causes blood vessels to relax and widen and lowers the heart rate. Doxazosin does the same by blocking the effects of adrenaline on muscles throughout the body. Lisinopril blocks the enzyme angiotensin, which tightens blood vessels, leading to lower blood pressure. All the patients were tracked for 48 years. All of these drugs have been proved safe and effective. We just didn't know what worked best as a first-line therapy for the many, many people with high blood pressure. The main outcomes of interest were death from coronary heart disease or a heart attack that didn't lead to death. And by those measures, there wasn't really much of a difference between any of the four drugs in that period. But chlorthalidone outperformed two of the others in lowering systolic blood pressure. That drug also performed better in preventing heart failure, a gradual weakening of the heart, and stroke, and lowering rates of cardiovascular disease. The take-home message was that the diuretic was better in preventing at least one of the major types of cardiovascular disease, it was also the least expensive. As you can imagine, this is immensely valuable information. It tells us what drug is best to start if you have someone over 55 with high blood pressure and at least one risk factor for coronary heart disease. That's exactly the kind of question that only a comparative effectiveness trial can answer. This study was enormous took place in 623 centers in Canada and the United States between 1994 and 1998 and included over 33,000 participants. It also cost more than $100 million, and that was two decades ago. So was the debate over? Oh, no. A stunning number of papers have been written critiquing this study. There are methodological concerns, and that the primary endpoint, death and heart attacks, was somewhat ignored in favor of secondary outcomes like strokes and blood pressure. Most of the patients had probably been on other therapies before starting the trial, so it's not clear if prior therapy could have changed results. Many patients received more than one drug, and this stepwise addition, or adding drugs one at a time, might have favored the diuretic. Significantly more people on the diuretic developed diabetes than those on other drugs. And in the many years since the trial, 
These drugs have all become cheaper and generic, and more drugs have appeared, making the answers somewhat murky once again. Recent work in the Journal of the American Heart Association even improved on this huge 2002 study by showing that using a combination of drugs to treat hypertension initially is better than starting patients on one drug and then progressing to more. In the United States, comparative effectiveness trials are supported almost exclusively by the National Institutes of Health and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. The latter's executive director, Joe Selby, wrote to me, and I'm quoting him here, it's essential that we learn to ask and answer practical questions about the comparative clinical effectiveness of therapy options in the course of everyday care. He also said the Research Institute was the only organization dedicated primarily to supporting and expanding this kind of research in the United States, quoting him again, with a rigor and scale that matched the importance of this relatively new approach to building knowledge and information. The Research Institute's budget constitutes a small percentage of overall public research funding. Basic science research is necessary to make breakthroughs in how treatments might be created. Randomized controlled trials are necessary to determine if they have efficacy. Pragmatic trials can tell us if and how they're effective in real world settings. Health services research can improve the ways in which we deliver them. But without comparative effectiveness research, too many important questions that concern patients will remain unanswered. Do you like the show? Always helps if you like or subscribe right down there. And another good way for you to support the show is a subscription service called Patreon.com, where you, the viewer, can directly support on anything you like, like a dollar a month, more if you like, but if you don't want to, totally fine as well. Go to Patreon.com slash Healthcare Trash to see how you can help. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz, Crafty Geek, and Jonathan Dunn, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. As always, Go to httmerch.com to pick up good healthcare triage merch and my book, The Bad Food Bible, still on sale in stores.